Hello, beautiful people. I am Oliver Perrin for Semiagog, joined this evening by the Prudentialist, and very happy it is so. Before we move over to introducing him, I'm going to go through the process of shilling my stuff and uh, welcoming you all. Please, please do recognize that you can follow this channel, Semiagog as well as the little used backup sister channel, A Safer Space. And you can do that on YouTube. You can do that on BitChute, God help you. And I very much hope that you will do it on Odyssey. There is also Mines, which I probably haven't checked in, I don't know, a, a coon's age. Uh, there is Gab, where I am fairly active, Telegram, where I'm increasingly active, and uh, Twitter. Um, and then there are those who make all of this possible. These are the... Uh, the mighty, the Praetorian Chads, who, uh, now oh, come on now, there we go, who, who make all of this possible. They are my patrons, and they are due all of the credit, and of course, none of the blame. I want to thank them one and all for making this possible. I very, very much appreciate the uh, support for the channel. And uh, then there is the, uh, the fine, fine selection of books that you can get your paws on. This is a uh, Vinculum, a science fiction book. You can find that on Amazon under the name Oliver Perrin. That's about a, uh, a book thief in the year 2076 in Istanbul, who's pursued by uh, remorseless corporate hitmen and an esoteric sect of assassins. I hope you will check that out. And um, well, I, I don't expect it will be of much interest to most of you. There is uh, my collection of poetry. This is called Cinders from the Bloomery of Youth. That's under the name Oliver Timken Perrin. You can find this on uh, Amazon as well. So I think that covered, oh, one last thing. I spoke to Mr. Tim Rudisill today. So this, this episode is uh, dedicated to him uh, since he is the one who uh, has over many years assisted me with getting my head around uh, geopolitics. Um, he said to say hello to everyone and he is making sounds as though he might uh, come through here next week, perhaps the week after, just as a proof of life. I don't know if he will be on for a full episode, but um, there that is. I, I, I hope so, because he's been ground down under all sorts of issues he's been enjoying. So it would be great to see him appear. He's even saying he might hold up a, uh, <clears throat> a copy of the New York Times with the current days, uh, you know, with the current date on it. Um, in order to prove that he does, in fact, still draw breath. So uh, that covers the opening. We're going to be talking about Afghanistan, and we're going to be doing a winding, um, very likely disorganized um, review of uh, the geopolitical situation there and uh, potential directions that all of this can go, might go. Um, in some cases, uh, very likely will go, uh, particularly as regards the Wakhan Corridor. But I'm anticipating things and getting ahead of myself. Allow me to introduce our guest or give him the opportunity to introduce himself. We are joined this evening by the Prudentialist, who has a channel of his own. But I'm going to turn it over to him for a moment to uh, introduce himself. Maybe uh, you can uh, tell folks a bit about your channel, sir, and, and we'll go from there. Well, thank you. I'm really happy to be on. I've been following you for a while. And in fact, I just ordered a uh, Viniculum the other day off of Amazon. So I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm a big science fiction fan. A man um, of taste and distinction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but hello, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Prudentialist. I have a channel where I give a commentary on, you know, politics, culture, and the goings on. Um, and much like Morgoth, I have the pleasure of living close to a body of water. So I do the occasional fishing video as well. But every Sunday, um, much like Semiagog and Tim, I provide commentary and analysis on geopolitics. I studied international relations in college, and I focus in political science. So every Sunday, I do a show roughly around the same time. And we cover various topics, whether it's theory, current events, and you know potential forecastings of geopolitical events. And of course, like many in the chat have kind of noted and joked with, uh, I, find, I finalize it with a uh, more happy and cheery note with a frog of the week. So we always go off with a new species to try and end things on a happier note. Um, but with that, I'm happy to dive into Afghanistan once again. I've done two streams on it before all of the goings on and uh, Kabul and the Taliban takeover. So it'll be fun to talk about after everything that's happened. Yes, indeed. Well, let me see if I can get my things uh, straightened out here. It's going to be just one brief boomer moment for me to... Uh sort this out. I just got to make sure that I'm sharing the right screen here with the selection of things that we have put together. Um, 
Prudentialist was a great help in the background research. He's got quite a talent for it. Let me get over here to uh, maps. Yes, there we go. Now let's see if I can share this screen. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. There we are. Come now. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so now how do I make this thing go away so we can see more map? There we are. All right. Let's see if we can make this even bigger for the moment. Prudentialist, I was thinking of just going through the, the basics here really quickly about what we're looking at with this uh, with this situation. Okay, let me pull it up on the on the map so we can see what it is we're dealing with. Of course, this right here. Is, is my cursor visible to you, Prudentialist? I can see it, yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, so this is where Afghanistan is located. You know, I'm speaking to any number of Americans who probably have never looked at a globe before in their lives. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, you can consider it sort of South Asia, sort of Middle East. It's in its own little spot. And um, it's uh, w what's important about it, it, it is, is that we've got China here, right? And then we've got the rest of the world, and we know that China wants to connect over land to the rest of the world. And uh, Afghanistan is in a nice, neat spot for them to be able to do it. Now, we, we are going to be um, reviewing some of the things that I mentioned in a stream that I was on uh, last night with, um, with Academic Agent. And uh, some of the people watching were saying that it was like an ent moot that I wouldn't get to the point. Um, if uh, if you're expecting me to very quickly get to the point, or a Prudentialist for that matter, this is probably not the right stream for you because we're going to be going uh, in depth on this. So the first thing to understand about this, let me jump over to a flat map as this is going to make some things uh, easier. Make all these damned things go away that we are. Now let's make it smaller. What's important to understand about this here's our position with Afghanistan, is that this is a story about China. This is a story about Russia. This is a story about India and about Pakistan and Iran. And of course, about the United States um, and uh, you know Europe and the rest. So there are a number of different ways that we can look at what's going on with Afghanistan. We can look at it in terms of what countries surround it. We can look at it in terms of which countries want to punch roots through it. And uh, we can look at it in terms of uh, competition between Russia and China for dominance on the Eurasian landmass. And I guess uh, that's probably the best place to start. China has enormous energy needs. And they simply don't at present have enough domestic production to meet those needs. And of course, their whole model is based on the idea that they're a production house for the rest of the world. And so they need to ship things to places in the rest of the world, but they also need resources and energy in order to produce those things. And uh, in terms of the country itself, it's not, you know, a it's not the screaming top contender for uh, natural resources, uh, nor is it for energy which means it's got to go further afield to find those things. Now, China, of course, historically is one of these countries that has sort of minded its own business. Uh, you know, it's uh, always been referred to as, uh, as a country that, uh, you know, is sort of inward turned. And uh, they, they generally, when barbarians come in, they find a way to absorb them. And when they can't, they build big walls, that sort of thing. Um, so China is a country that historically has sort of been inward facing and has wanted basically just to be left the hell alone, you know, with some exceptions, trying to invade Japan, you know, some things in uh, Southeast, Southeast Asia, you know, moving into Mongolia or the Turin Basin. But because of the global situation that they're faced with, their strategists figured out, in my view anyway, that what they need to do is uh, play the global game or else they'll always be, um, you know, outclassed and a few steps behind. So they have put together two programs that really part of the same thing. It's the One Belt, One Road and the, uh, the String of Pearls. The One Belt, One Road is an overland um, project to connect China to uh, other places in Asia, as well as um, eventually to make it over to Europe um, and the Middle East. And then the uh, string of pearls idea is um, 
more maritime and it's a set of trade routes that will take it to places like Southeast Asia and India, the coast of Africa, and of course, and into Africa proper. And they're doing things with uh, South and Central America as well. And of course, they're a mercantilist country. Uh, you know, for those who um, are aware of such things, they're huge diaspora uh, Chinese populations that pretty much keep to themselves in places like Singapore in places like Indonesia, increasingly in places like uh, Australia um, and uh, Latin America now as well. So China has to break out of uh, the potential for containment in terms of its situation on land and its situation uh, at sea. And of course, the United States Navy is the dominant naval power. And while they're doing everything they can to increase, increase um, their uh, blue water fleet, they're still well behind the United States. So we're going to leave the naval part of this out for now. And we're going to be focusing on the overland issues. So um, Iran is a major ally of China, as is uh, North Korea over here. Now, uh, Russia and India are at best competitors, um, at worst, they're enemies. You know, there's uh, all kinds of things going on along the quote unquote line of actual control between China and India. Um, India is um, actually doing some things now in terms of uh, naval development with these islands here, the uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And that is based on the fact that so much naval traffic has to go here through the Straits of uh, Malacca and um, Indian uh, naval arrangements here could uh, potentially cut things off. Of course, the Chinese are trying to get around them with developments, port facilities in Sri Lanka and other places. But as I said, we're not going to go into the, um, the business of the naval part. But it is important to understand that Russia and India are at very least competitors for China. China wants to cut its way through Asia to reach the Middle East and Europe, both because they want to be able to sell their goods there, but they also want to bring um, energy um, back over to them because, as I said, they're a sucking hole for that. That's part of what's going on in the South China Sea. There's a lot of oil here, which is why we eventually went to Vietnam, which is why they're building um, artificial islands now. And there's a bunch of huff and puff about it because it's hopefully going to be another source of energy for them. So if they want to cut their way across, they've got to basically do it above India and below Russia, which means they're going to have to go through the stands. Now, what a lot of people don't um, recognize, of course, viewers of this channel will realize that China has steadily been pushing uh, westward for quite some time. They've taken over Xinjiang which is also known as East Turkestan. And they've also taken over Tibet. You see all these lakes here in the high plateaus of the Himalayas. They feed rivers that take care of all of Southeast Asia, China, and many other places further uh, afield. <clears throat> but for our purposes, what we have to look at is the, the way they've made it all the way over westward to this, come on now, this these damn track pads and this new operating system makes me want to stick knitting needles in my eyes. Okay, this is the westernmost point of China. And you can see that it nudges right up against and actually touches this little finger of territory coming off of Afghanistan, which is called the Wakhan Corridor. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at it over here to see just how rough it is, because we're going to talk about the Wakhan Corridor and come back to it. And I'm going to go into some other things first. But since we're talking about it, I just want people to see exactly how rough that country is. Now, of course, this is a Google interface design, which means you get this crappy design on their maps where you're just struggling to figure out where the border lines are. Come on now. It's right in this area. It's up from Bagram. Let me zoom in if I can see, if, see it more clearly. It should be this little jobby right here, but I'm not seeing the border shown. But at any rate, the important thing, I'm going to like make me scream and screech because I can't see it. There we are. They call it the walk-on corridor, nature refuge. You see this? This is the roof of the world. Walk-on corridor is up in here. So to give you a sense of how rough that country is, we have this satellite view here. And I suppose there are a few areas in the uh, in uh, the Himalayas and the rest, the Pamirs and the Tian Shan that are rougher, but um, 
not by much. So you have to understand that after they come off these, you know, crazy deserts and plains, they've got to pass through these mountains and they are extremely uh, rough country. So what you have then is, uh, is this need to cross Afghanistan and to connect with Iran, which is a partner of theirs. It's in Iran's interest because they've been surrounded on all sides and are, have essentially been under, under siege for quite some time. Uh, and it's in China's interests because they can sell goods in Iran. They can pull resources out of Iran, long uh, and famously a source of uh, iron ore. Um, but by the same token, they can pull energy from Iran and keep their factories working. Now, they can do that to some extent by sea, but they've got to go around India and they've got to go through the Straits of Hormuz. <clears throat> and that entails passing a number of U.S. military bases that are in these Gulf states. And uh, you've got a number of countries that are increasingly unfriendly, you know, backed by Saudi Arabia with Iran. So this could be cut off and that would be a real mess. So it's in Iran's interests and China's interest to punch across this territory. Now, they have connected to Iran down through Pakistan and in fact, already do have um, some connections beginning to uh, come online and work in terms of connecting with Iran, but they have to go a different route that's much longer and they have to pass through in this area, as we'll see with some of the maps that we're going to be looking at. Uh, Prudentialist has turned, over all, uh, turned up all kinds of great stuff. But the problem with taking that southern route is that they're much more susceptible to interdiction by India which is a strong competitor, if not enemy in some respects. And they're susceptible to interdiction by the um, U.S. bases and uh, U.S. aligned Gulf states with their, you know, shiny new fighter uh, jets that they bought from the United States. So going this way is longer, um, which makes it more expensive and time consuming, and it's subject to interdiction. And uh, we have we have seen that, you know, as I said, the situation with uh, India and China is not good at present. And Pakistan, you know, if you think Afghanistan's corrupt and it is, um, Pakistan is like, you know, charging that with nitrous oxide. So the engine roars. Pakistan is insanely corrupt and uh, and it has a huge population, whereas in Afghanistan, there are all kinds of games that they could play and uh, have it work much more smoothly. Um, so that is the general picture. The only thing I want to add before I turn to Prudentialist to see what else he might want to add in terms of the general picture is to uh, make everyone well aware <clears throat> that once China makes it to Iran, the idea is that they're going to want to punch out further and make it to the Mediterranean. That's not only because of Iranian energy, but because of the developments going on now in the Eastern Mediterranean with uh, natural gas fields um, in the, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Now, there are a couple ways that they could do it. <clears throat> One, they could cut a deal with Turkey. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, they're, they're, they will be next to these areas where Russia is in a much better position to play some games. And this area, no less, well, I mean, not to the same extent as the Pamirs and the Himalayas, but this area has quite a bit of very rough country in it too. So, and, and as does Eastern Turkey, which is a very rough country as well. So they can sort of shoot through here. I'm sorry to say I've forgotten the name of the valley now, but there is one area that there's been a lot of talk about putting pipelines in. And I think perhaps even some of the, yeah, there, there are already a few pipeline arrangements made, but, um, you know, China could make it to Iran and go up through the Caucasus, but um, Russia has shown that it is still willing to play around in here. You know, the the better uh, choice in terms of having it be less expensive um, runs up very close to the border of Russia, and they could play games with destabilizing any of these countries. You know, Armenia, for example, is frozen with a frozen conflict. So there's some issues there. They could work something out with Turkey, but the problem is that this country is so rough that it's very difficult to build transport and uh, energy, you know, infrastructure corridors there. Um, so there's a sweet spot that runs just along the underbelly of Turkey. And it just so happens that uh, that that sweet spot is also what is historically called Kurdistan, though we don't see it on maps. And I wonder, is it a coincidence that the European powers with the Sykes-Picot agreement split up Kurdistan among these various countries so that they would later have a lever that they could pull if they ever wanted to destabilize this route? Weird. Must be coincidence. 
anyway, one of the routes that they could take would be through Kurdistan. Um, but if they came that route, they'd have to run just under uh, underneath the rough country of uh, southeastern Turkey here. And there's this little projecting area, the Sanjak of Alexandretta, um, Iskenderun, um, which uh, Turkey was very careful to get um, within its power. Um, it didn't happen when Ataturk was alive. It happened under uh, Ismet Inönü. But I believe the geostrategic thinkers in Turkey at the time knew that it was important to uh, try to cut off this little area because they knew that this would be a major uh, possible route. Even that far back, um, I'll add. So they could go through Syria and Iraq. The issue there is if the lever for Kurdistan doesn't get pulled, um, there's uh, the United States, which was very happy to go in here and destabilize Iraq and um, put their troops in, which then put them in Afghanistan on one side of Iran and in Iraq on the other side of Iran and down with the United Arab Emirates and bases there right below Iran, effectively containing them on three sides. And uh, now we've seen how this is all destabilized. And if we zoom in on this area of, um, of uh, Syria, the Turks have blocked off this area with Iskenderun and they've seized this area of uh, Efrin in Syria. And they have all their mercenary troops bottled up here. It's not showing up on the map, I'm sorry to say. There, where is it now? Come on now, we're looking for Idlib. What's happening to you? I'm up in Turkey still. Anyway, it's right ar around here. I'm sounding like an idiot because I can't find it pr uh, quickly on the map. But, um, it, it's, and it's the nature of this map. Here, let's jump over to this one because it'll be easier. Basically, once they get to Iran, they could come out this way, but there are issues with Russia. Um, they could go directly with Turkey because China is increasingly um, uh, improving its relations with Turkey, loaning them huge amounts of money, that kind of thing. Um, but again, this is very rough country. So they could come in south of that through Iraq, which is destabilized, Syria, which is destabilized. But if they don't want to deal with Turkey, I mean, and this is also a very little mountainous area, they'd have to come out just underneath it. And just underneath Turkey is where Turkey has moved in into uh, Idlib. Come on now. Good God, what's going on? Am I blind? Anyway, Idlib is in this general area and it blocks access to the sea. So essentially what's happened is it's off the M4, so it should be visible here. This is like my boomer retard moment, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, the point is, that Turkey has gone to the trouble, you know, how it's got this little peninsula, so to speak, this little jutting southern portion. They've actually pushed even further down to about here to block the rest of the possible exit. And you know what that just leaves? It leaves this little area, which they could go out through. The problem is the Russians have a naval base here at Tardis, and uh, the Russians, uh, if anybody wants to punch out through this area, um, they're going to have to deal with them and the Syrians. So then there's the possibility of Lebanon, but you know, oh, it's just crazy. The Beirut port just blew up. Imagine that. So they've got some issues in terms of having their route to the Mediterranean and therefore to the Middle East and Europe all the way from China going the rest of the way. But they definitely know that they want to get as far as Iran because they get a number of different options then and they can push from there. So that is is the general picture of uh, China wanting to run this way and also to have things run back again in this direction. But remember, they have to thread the needle between Russia and India because Russia has any number of interests here. But now I've been talking forever, uh, Prudentialist, before we jump into like details of some of the various things you found, what would you, what would you like to, uh, to add, sir? Sure. So I noticed in the chat there was a question, or at least in regards to the relationship between China and Russia. And I think the reason why Semi Agog is arguing for the point that there will be competition between China and Russia is that historically, Russia has made several pipeline agreements and deals to provide China's energy needs since the late 1990s, and has been ongoing and increasing in its worth of billions and billions of dollars, especially towards natural gas. Now, given the variety of resources that you can get from Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan, especially with Afghanistan's mineral and oil wealth, 
there is concern over Russia's ability to lose out on its current agreements. Secondly, you also have the concern that their existing sort of agreement on paper of cooperation between China and Russia, especially in East Asia and Eurasian affairs, has been that China provides the economic foreign direct investment and provides the infrastructure necessary for its trade routes and its Belt and Road Initiative, while Russia utilizes its military muscle to provide security. Now, the question then becomes, well, if China is going to thread the needle, where does that leave Russia? Especially with countries that border Afghanistan, say like that of um, Tajikistan and I believe uh, Turkmenistan, nations that are members of the CTSO, which is Russia's sort of cooperative security agreement similar to that of NATO, um, you will have significant tensions rise between Russia's security needs and that of China trying to thread the needle to meet its own interests and natural resources ends. If anyone who's an adherent to, you know, uh, economic interdependence theory, those who are on the realist side will tell you that when trade expectations are likely to decrease, as Russia sees it with the lack of oil and natural gas being exported, as China tries to cut through them or around them, that relationships are most likely to decrease and the likelihood for conflict increases as well. So there's definitely a likelihood for a China-Russia rivalry to happen. Um, and what's more important, as uh, Semyagod was talking about, Lebanon is also in a complete state of disarray. I was having a conversation last Sunday with a Lebanese writer and commentator who also backs me on Subscribestar, telling me that there is a black market, that you know people are waiting in lines for food, like basic necessities such as bread at 3 a.m. Hospitals are relying on private generators. It's very close to becoming a failed state. So there are you know plenty of options. The other thing to consider with Turkey, of course, is that Turkey is threading the needle on its leverage to get out of the United States and the European Union, what benefits it can have. And its relationship with Russia, while historically has been stressful and tenuous due to its membership of NATO and being a former housing site of American nuclear weapons on its country, the Syrians, in, or the, uh, excuse me, Turkey, within a short period of time, went from shooting down Russian aircraft in regards to the Syrian civil war to now buying, you know, S-400 surface-to-air missiles from the Russians and improving their diplomatic ties with President Vladimir Putin and his uh, cohorts. So there is a lot at play here between the various parties that are involved. And China is trying its very best to sort of thread that needle and find out where it needs to go because there are very many overlapping alliances, different diplomatic ties and strategic relationships with everyone involved. It's not just sort of a US EU kind of problem versus everybody because many regional players have their own economic and strategic interests as well. So those are just some added things to throw on to our general analysis, but much like when it comes to maps, uh, Mark Twain always said that America goes to war so its people can learn geography and that's what we're doing today. Absolutely. Well, let me just show you this. This is another angle too. Now I mentioned this briefly on um, on uh, AA stream, but there is uh, McKinder's uh, thesis. He's a geo strategist, and and it was developed uh, after he first came up with it, and has undergone a number of changes. But this roughly, you know, nineteen oh four, I believe, somewhere in there, is the basic idea, and so. It, as I mentioned in that last stream, if you if you imagine, you know, sort of the classic idea of the Spartans who, you know, um, control the land in ancient Greece and you have the idea of the Athenians who control the sea. Well, you can see here you've got this Eurasian landmass. And based on this theory, you've got this sort of heartland or pivot area, which is sort of the core of the Eurasian landmass. And according to Mackinder's theory, sort of the Atlantic powers are like the Athenians and they control um, the rimlands and they control the seas. And uh, based on this idea, the um, this pivot area or heartland uh, yields control of the Eurasian landmass, which, you know, is a power of its own because it can reach all these other coasts. Um, and there's, of course, this sort of marginal crescent, right? So you've got the idea that there needs to be sort of one big dog uh, in the heart of the Eurasian landmass and that that will yield uh, control of the land um, in such a fashion that it can compete even with those uh, who control the seas. And so as, as soon as you start to imagine the Chinese in there and the Russians in there, and remember, the Chinese economy at this point vastly outpaces the Russian economy, which, you know, if I'm 
if I'm remembering correctly, I've heard things about it being roughly the size the the, the the economy in terms of, you know, its throughput in Russia is something like the economy of the state of New York. Whereas, you know, depending on how you measure it, um, the Chinese economy either is about to um, um, exceed or has already exceeded the, the U.S. economy. You can start to see why it is not in um, Russia's long term interests at all. To allow uh, the the uh, Chinese to steal a march on them, let me just close this. Um, and there are other ways that this picture. If you just if anybody who's interested in this sort of thing, if you go and do uh, some searches for images, you'll find many other ways that sort of Mackinder's ideas are laid out. And as I've mentioned, they they have been through a number of. Um, of, uh, of changes over the years in terms of how they're conceived, you know, and the details of the, the arrangement. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, that is a central concern for a power like, uh, Russia. So let's get over here and take a look at what's going on with, um, with Afghanistan itself. <clears throat> so we can get into some of these, um, details, as I said, Prudentialist has pulled up all kinds of good material for us. Um, the first thing to understand about Afghanistan is that it is, it's an artificial nation. I mean, like, I mean, I don't know at this point, let's just say the majority of nations on earth, they're just artificially cobbled together things. But in Afghanistan, it's a particularly exaggerated uh, situation. So let me get over here. Yeah, this is the one I was looking for. How fortuitous. This is a map uh, that Prudentialist pulled. And now we're looking at Pakistan as well, which we kind of have to because it's so interrelated with what's going on in Afghanistan. This black line, uh, particularly black line here, is the dividing line of the Afghan border with the, um, the Pakistani border, or the border of Pakistan, I should say. Now, what we have here is a number of different ethnic groups. Now, um, Pakistan is obviously split. This sort of beige or khaki area, these are the uh, Pashtun. And this is uh, more or less an Iranian, or let's say an Iranic language speaking people, but they are different from the, uh, the Persians of Iran or the Iranians of Iran insofar as they are Sunni, they are not a uh, Twelver Shiite. And you can see how their territory is in the Northwest tribal territories of Pakistan, as well as these areas all over the place in, uh, in Afghanistan. Now we have the, uh, the Tajiks up in through here, and the Tajiks are uh, another Persian or Dari. I can't remember, but, um, you know, Farsi or Dari. It's, it's, they're an uh, Iranic or Iranian language group um, speaking people. Um, so these are people who speak sort of, uh, they're like cousins of the Persians, right? Um, and, you know, they're split up here in various areas. Now, and, and this is important when we start to think about things like the uh, Turks wanting to get involved. We've got uh, Turkmen up in through here on the border uh, of Turkmenistan. And by the by, I just checked online before we went live and Turkmenistan has closed its border to um, soldiers and civilians fleeing Afghanistan. Um, that's, you know, fresh in the news. But these are Turkmen. And um, they're sort of least last loss and loneliest in a number of respects. Um, we've also got, uh, who, are, who are these pink ones here? These are Pamiri. I didn't look into that, I'm afraid, so I can't tell you about uh, that ethnic group. Um, these are Hazara. Let me just pull this up if I can remember what's going on with them. I believe they're another Iranian language speaking group. Yeah, Persian speaking ethnic group. Um, so another one of that uh, same sort. And what else? The the sort of uh, golden color here. These are Uzbeks. They're also uh, uh, a Turkic language speaking group, like the Turkmen, right? So getting into these um, details, you can see. And what else do we have here? These guys here are uh, Baloch or um, you know uh, Baluchistan. Um, this this they're actually they run over here into Iran as well. Um, so and and it would be really interesting to have this uh this business of um uh the map showing the different ethnic groups flowing over into iran as well i'm getting a, a buzzing prudentialist i don't know if it's just coming through on my system would you mind muting your mic just for a second so i can see if that's where it was coming from
Yeah, maybe it's coming from you. Maybe it's coming from me with my new microphone setup. We'll see in a second. Um, and, I, and just to understand, uh, so you understand Prudential, so I'm not positive that's you. That might be me. Um, but the point is here, uh, but the first point I want to make is, is that this is a mosaic. It is all over the joint. You can see all of these ethnic groups. So you can see the extent to which Afghanistan is sort of a, a fiction. Afghanistan as a nation is entirely fictional. And you can see, and this is very important, this is why I said I would really have preferred to have seen this breakdown of the different ethnic groups um, extend over into Iran, because you can see how easy it would be, for example, if you created all kinds of problems with the Baluk or Baluch um, here in southern Afghanistan, it's basically an extension an artificially divided territory. So what's to keep it from extending down into Pakistan? Or you could start trouble in Pakistan and have it flow up into uh, Afghanistan. You can see how the Pashtun straddle both sides of the border here. And uh, historically, the Pakistani government control of the Northwest, tr Northwest tribal territories has been, you know, tenuous at best. Um, so there are many ways in which you can see how trouble ethnically in this area could flow over into the surrounding countries. And those surrounding countries include Iran and uh, China and Pakistan at a minimum. I mean, these other Central Asian republics aren't as bad as uh, Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan, but they're certainly no models of, you know, freedom of, from co corruption. So before we move on to looking at some of these other maps, uh, Prudentialist, do you have anything you want to add here? Sure. Uh, it's important to note that there's a lot of ethnic strife within Afghanistan. The uh, Pashtun people do make up the majority population inside Afghanistan, roughly 40% the last time that I had checked. Um, they have in the past, at least during the time of the Taliban um, in the late 1990s when they were in power, there was uh, ethnic strife and, and instances of ethnic cleansing of the Hazara people. And even more recently now, as the Taliban has made gains that has sort of resumed, there has been bombing of Hazara schools, especially girls schools. So that will something that we'll most likely see in the future. Um, also, uh, Semyagog, I did send you a link in the private chat for an ethnic breakdown of Iran on a map as well. Okay, excellent. Well, let me just jump over there and find it. <clears throat> Here we go. Excellent. Hopefully we can put these two maps next to each other and see what we get. Is that in there? There we go. Okay, so what is this? There's our Baluch down here in brown. So if we jump back over to the other map, where is it now? And let me just move this over so it's right next to it. Is that it? Nope, one more. Is that it? Yes. Okay, so what's green here is Baluch, corresponding over here in Iran to Baluch. And what do we have here? These are our quote unquote Persians. Okay, so it seems as though um, Baluch and whatever these guys are, Brahui, are the main ones. So it, certainly there can be some issues with um, the Baluch that could be, um, they could be agitated and create problems. I know that within Iran itself, the Baluch uh, can be problematic. The Baluchi are, are, are Baluch, they're a, a basically a nomadic people or semi-nomadic pastoralists. So they have never sort of fallen firmly under uh, a... a Iranian government control. So th this is a whole area corresponding to um, this area of Pakistan and Afghanistan where the sort of the trouble could go conceivably could go back and forth. I really want to emphasize that again, the trouble in Afghanistan could easily flow over to these other areas. And we are likely going to see um, as, as a, uh, refugees flow out of Afghanistan, the main route, as I mentioned on the stream with AA, you know, there are any number of Afghanis who are currently in Europe um, and Britain, you know, other places. And the, the main way they get there, I am convinced uh, a number of them are going through Russia and Russia's keeping it quiet, but the main flow of them and a verifiable flow of them, uh, unlike my beliefs, which are only speculations regarding Russia. I might be wrong. But uh, in terms of um, this particular route, which is Afghanistan to Iran, to Turkey, and then to Europe, that is for sure. So um, we're going to see heavy flows of people and already have been seeing it. I mean, Iran has been dealing with accommodating Afghani refugees for 
a long time. I mean, since way back into the 80s. Um, you know, if the Iranians uh, make fun of anyone uh, as much as they make fun of Turks, it's probably um, Afghanis. So this, the, this is going to be a route for quote unquote refugees from Afghanistan to Iran, to Turkey. Turkey is already full up to its gills. They're already uh, building a wall. Turkey is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there is all kinds of potential for uh, trouble along this route. So <clears throat> another thing to remember is that we have been screwing around in Afghanistan since the 1980s. So we're talking about 40 years of um, sort of doing all sorts of things, both openly and covertly in Afghanistan, that is the United States. And that means that there are any number of ways that, I mean, I, that Moses went out into the desert for 40 years and raised two generations to be true believers in his, <clears throat> his new faith, right? After having come out of Egypt. So this is 40 years during which people like Christians in action could have, um, you know, put plans together. And some of them do plan into the future, believe it or not. They're not all like the um, surface features of the intelligence agencies that we get exposure to. So you have a massive um, exodus of people going from Afghanistan into Iran and into Turkey. There are any number of ways that they could cause trouble and destabilize things on their way beyond the destabilizing features of them simply passing through and causing confusion and uh, public reaction and putting a strain on resources and, you know, additional expense and, you know, smuggling and drug trade and all these other things. I mean, it could be taken uh, quite a bit further uh, than that. So um, we've had a look at the um, ethnic breakdown here. And let's just take one more look here. The Kyrgyz who are at the end of the Wakhan corridor here <clears throat> are another Turkic language speaking people. And then let's just check on these Pamiris right quick. And they're an Iranic peoples. In language. One. Yeah. Eastern Iranian ethnic group. Okay. So basically what we're seeing here, just so everybody understands it, these, this, let me jump over to the bigger map so we can see it better. Historically, way, way, way back in the day, once upon a time, long ago, Iranian, well, people who were the ancestors of those of some of those we today call Iranians, they're called Sogdians, and they were traders. And they uh, made their way all the way up through Central Asia into what is now China. So there are actually, you know, statues from the... I think it's fourth century AD that have been dug up in China and there are people digging with shovels. The statues actually show guys working with shovels. I recently posted this on Twitter and they clearly are not East Asians. Um, they're probably Sogdian workers or slaves. Um, so since time immemorial, these sort of the Iranian ancestors of some of the people who are today Iranians made their way up through Central Asia. And I guess that's what we're seeing in terms of this patchwork of um, ethnicities, because uh, you know the the Pashtun are essentially uh, related or cousins of the Iranians, the Hazara are cousins of the Iranians, um, the Pamiris are, um, and some of these uh, uh, the Tajiks, as we we looked at. So, Iran is very much sort of in a position to move up in and through Central Asia. Um, given their ties. And uh, as recently as the great game in the 19th century, the Persian um, Persian control extended into large parts uh, of, Af of Afghanistan. So that is, uh, is certainly something to bear in mind. Now let's take a look. What should we go to here? Should we go over to, uh, how about, well, uh, before we get to that, I'm jumping ahead. Let me just uh, come back and ask, uh, as prudentialist, if there was anything that you wanted to add on this. Um, a few things that I would add, I guess, in regards to what's happening with the migrant issue that was discussed is that well, you're correct in saying that Turkey is full. They have roughly 4.5 million people of various descent, Iraqi and Syrian, um, which they've been using as a, as a point of leverage against the European Union in negotiations for 
either entrance into the EU or as a swift rebuttal when the EU criticizes Turkey for, you know, alleged human rights abuses or not being very democratic. So that's more or less their Trump card. And that's something that I've discussed on my channel in great extent. Um, the other thing is that you are bordering nations to Afghanistan, um, especially Tajikistan and uh, Turkmenistan. Um, they're under, you know, the CTSO agreement. So their borders are being currently, um, you know, the Taliban controls a good chunk of them, which of course is being called in for the Russian military to help secure the area. So you already have an increased Russian military presence along the Afghan border and the um, sort of former Soviet republics. That is correct. And there is another thing that we should probably take a look here uh, at here, which is the Eurasian Economic Union. So as their own sort of version, let me see if we can find a nice large version of this. I want ASEAN, I want Eurasian Economic Union and a clear map. Sorry, peoples. I should, let's just go to the damn um, text on it. People are going to have to like work it out in terms of their their understanding relative to maps. Okay, so Russia has set up its own economic union and it's sort of um, brought on board everybody that they could uh, as quickly as they could. So Armenia is a member, Belarus, um, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and of course Russia. Um, but there are some <clears throat> interesting ones to look at here. Here we go. Uzbekistan is an observer member and they have not um, yet become full members. That's interesting to look at because I believe in a number of respects, uh, China is uh, considering trying to peel them away. Uh, and as I recall, there's also some questions about uh, Tajikistan. Let me see if we can find down here. Yeah, Tajikistan was formally invited to join the union and it has expressed an interest in acceding uh, to the union. It's recognized as a potential candidate and membership negotiations are underway. So what we're looking at here is two very important countries for our purposes when we look at the map, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, right? These um, are countries that uh, potentially China in moving westward could do something moving through. Um, but Russia, you know, these are former, um, you know, stands under the Soviet system. And they're still considered, quote unquote, the backyard uh, of Russia by the Russians. Near so, abroad. I'm sorry? The near abroad. Yes. And uh, they're, these are countries that China would like very much to peel away. Um, and Russia seems to be hanging on to them, but it is noteworthy. I mean, w w they have so many suitors, you know, they're, they're, they just, they're like, well, I'm not so sure. Yeah. Maybe we'll join the, the Eurasian economic union. Oh, we're not sure. The fact that they have not yet acceded, I think is due to uh, Chinese pressure and they're trying to keep their options open and they're probably getting their pockets, uh, greased. Um, you have to understand Uzbekistan is a major, uh, cotton producing, uh, country. Um, and the Chinese are actually being rather successful in trying to peel away Uzbekistan from the Russian sphere of influence. I remember in college that not well, yeah, it was, I think in college I was attending some sort of conference. I know that um, the trade between Uzbekistan and China has increased greatly over the last ten years. I know in I think it was 2019, the Prime Minister uh, Aripov had said that China is their closest partner. Um, so they have an increasingly strong uh, economic relationship as well as a diplomatic one. And that just goes to underscore the point we were making earlier about the likely issues uh, that are going to be emerging in this faux friendly relationship between Russia and China over time, because, you know, this is a possible path for uh, China to move westward. And we can already see how in doing so, they're simply sort of peeling off all these other countries as they go west. Um, and so it's a, it's doubtless a concern for Russia uh, in terms of what kind of things are happening uh, down here in uh, Afghanistan. And uh, as we talked about, uh, or as I mentioned in my stream with uh, AA just yesterday, Turkey, um, there was a recent uh, report in the last day or two that Erdogan had said, oh yeah, the Taliban are fine. There's nothing major that stands between uh, us and their version of uh, Islam. 
And so we should get along well. And uh, uh, the Taliban in uh, response were like, yeah, Turkey's fine. We're happy to work with you and do things with you. Um, so you've got Iranians who have a massive amount of historical cultural influence through Afghanistan, but you do have pockets of um, Turkic language speaking groups who could be considered cousins of the Turks in the same way some of these groups in Afghanistan are cousins of the uh, in Afghanistan are cousins of the Iranians um, and you've got a number of Turkish language speaking stands surrounding all of this so Turkey wants to play in this game Iran wants to play in this game China wants to get across uh, Russia has a history of having power here and uh, as we talk about, India is concerned about some of these things because of what might happen with uh, Pakistan. But let's move on now, uh, unless you have anything else, Prudentialist, to some of these other maps. No, I think we're okay for now. Okay, well, let's first off take a look at the um, minerals. I'll go ahead and close this Iran map. Okay, so yeah, Prudentialist was kind enough to find this map. This is uh, Afghanistan's mineral wealth. Now, I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough about minerals to go into you know what things are most valuable, but I know things like lithium, um, and Afghanistan has just enormous deposits of lithium worth huge amounts of money that have been discovered. Um, Lithium is obviously important for things like uh, batteries. I believe uh, cobalt is as well. Um, I know um, uh, D was uh, John D on uh, AA stream was talking about cobalt. I don't see it here, but I'm no expert on it and didn't look into it closely. But we can see a, a general picture of the mineral resources here. And that's very important, again, when you consider the fact that China not only needs energy, it needs to have resources so that it can build the crap that it's gonna to sell to the rest of the world, which is its current model of uh, global engagement. Is there anything that you wanted to add uh, here, Prudentialist? Sure, so some of those minerals in there, um, cobalt, for instance, if you are interested in updating, say, your nuclear triad, uh, cobalt-laced nuclear missiles increases the um, yield of said weapons. Uh, chromium is used to harden steel and manufacture stainless steel, so it won't rust. Um, which is essential for any sort of infrastructure or construction project that you want to go on, especially for China with its Belt and Road Initiative. Um, additionally, there's been numerous reports from the U.S. Geological Survey that came out in 2010, which is how we're aware of this vast mineral wealth that has been estimated in value between one to three trillion dollars USD, um, which also includes cobalt and uranium. So this is just a, you know, hypothetical gold mine for those that are interested in doing so. However, resource extraction for a lot of these mineral deposits inside Afghanistan has been mired by both the American occupation, political corruption, and the fighting with the Taliban, to a point where even the former president of the Afghan Republic, because that's definitely what it is now, it's former, um, had said that they are under a resource curse, their inability to actually extract it and make it towards you know their energy needs. Um, on top of this, of course, you have the interest of the Taliban to extract it. And recently, the Taliban's foreign minister had given a statement days prior to the fall of uh, Kabul that they welcome Chinese investment and infrastructure projects into the area, with the important caveat that they are not interested in China's internal affairs as to avoid any sort of goings-on in the Xinjiang province. So we can definitely see that there is a likely heavy interest of Chinese um, resource extraction, similar to what we see in uh, Africa to possibly happen in this area. Excellent. And I believe you found a report here on uh, mineral resources, but I'm guessing you probably just gave us a few highlights out of that. Yeah, this is the, um, uh, Petru uh, the inter interior energy report from the Afghan uh, government before it fell in 2020. Um, this is an overlay map of the original USGS survey. There is a lot within that um, corridor that we were talking about earlier. Um, despite its mountainous region, there is a lot that is possible to extract. Um, the other important thing to understand is that when we look at the global stage of, um, you know, the rare earth mineral trade, China has anywhere between a rough 90 to 95 percent monopoly on the export of rare earth minerals that are necessary, whether that's cobalt, whether that's lithium, um, not to mention their mining operations inside of uh, Africa, um, which makes it an important security concern for any sort of Western power or geopolitical rival when it comes to 
operating their military equipment. You need this for their semiconductors. You need this for any of your so-called smart bombs or laser-guided missiles, things like that. Um, uh, which, of course, the United States has rare earth mineral resources, but due to environmental regulations, um, they are not necessary. Um, and I know I'm using the term rare earth mineral rather than a generalized term, but they, they do have, you know, a significant step up over the United States or other Western powers when it comes to the export of these important terms um, or minerals, excuse me. So there's definitely a lot available. Um, of course, the Afghan government and its people, not even the United States has been able to extract it. So, I mean, there's a vast opportunity for whoever can come in for sort of a 21st century scramble for Afghanistan, which I think the Chinese are definitely in first place in this race. Yes. And uh, you made a good point there about our own rare earth mineral production. We've got spots and we, we can do it, um, but we simply won't because of how uh, filthy, so to speak, the process is. And there was some talk when Trump was in office of bringing our one production facility uh, back online. And for whatever reason, uh, the decision was made uh, not to do that. So yeah, there's let's let's the real takeaway here is that there is vast mineral wealth, and that that mineral wealth, in addition to just being wealth, and uh, in addition to being um, central to all sorts of important modern um, production processes, um, it's of uh, great strategic uh, significance in a number of respects. So that is just something to bear in mind. Now let's take a look at. Um, before we get to that, let's look over at the situation prior to and following the invasion. Okay, so um, this is just something to look at. Once upon a time, as many of you have been alive long enough perhaps to know, uh, the Taliban controlled uh, the majority of um, Afghanistan and uh, they were just knocked back when the U.S. came in and invaded. So it, it, I thought it would be interesting to, uh, to take a look at um, what that looked like um, prior to 9-11, and uh, the Prudentialist um, uh, quite happily found this uh, pair of maps. This is pre-9-11, uh, and look at the one area that the Northern Alliance was holding out and managing to still control. It's the very area that has that long little finger of land that is the Wakhan corridor that would connect Afghanistan to China. Odd how the uh, Northern Alliance fell back into that spot and that was the one that they were managing to hang on to. So, you know, I said, wow, Prudentialist, let's take a look because I recall Russia's behind it, but let's just take a look, you know, let's, let's go back in time and see if we can figure out who it was that was backing the Northern Alliance. And sure enough, we can read here until recently, the Alliance's main backers were Iran, Russia, and Tajikistan. Now, Tajikistan is just another way, uh, particularly back when this was done, which was what, 2001, Tajikistan is just another way to say Russia, right? So until recently, the main backers of the Northern Alliance, who were the minority opposition against the um, against the uh, Taliban, they were uh, Russia uh, and Iran. Now, the groupings of the uh, Northern Alliance that once upon a time was fighting against the Taliban, they were ethnic uh, Tajiks. And then you had um, folks from uh, Western Central Provinces. And then you had uh, Uzbeks, who are Turkic uh, speaking. So you got Hazara, who are Shiites, who are obviously going to be um, competing and likely unfriendly with the Pashtuns and uh, the other Sunnis, right? And you've got these uh, Turkic language speaking groups who, you know, are not speaking some language that's a cousin of the uh, Persians, Iranians. Um, and then you have these uh, ethnic Tajiks who are. Um, who well, for whatever reason are left out of the mix. So the Northern Alliance was a, a group of minorities jammed together. I guess it was an intersectional alliance, um, but they kept getting uh, screwed. And their their great commander, um, whatever, another, I think it was a Masood or whatever, he got uh, blown up when that guy came in with a fake video camera that had a bomb in it. And I, I, I was around back in the day and remember hearing about that. Um, so once upon a time, 
this was the last area before we invaded when the Taliban had control of just about everything for some reason or another. And this is significant. So I want to directly underscore it back at that point when they had to hang on to something, this minority group fighting the Taliban, resisting them, the Northern Alliance backed by Russia, where did they put all their energy and effort into holding on to the territory? Well, it just happened to be that one area that would allow them to connect with China. And again, backed by Russia. And it was that one area that would allow them to connect with China, which shows, I believe, or at least I should say suggests that this group, when it was backed by Russia, uh, got its marching orders um, and was told to, if you're going to hold on to anything, hold the choke point that would allow all of this to connect with China. And you have to bear that in mind vis-a-vis -vis all the things we've been discussing about, you know, um, China's desire to have an overland route and to run it outside the direct sphere of influence of the Russians. So this is just another sort of bit of evidence that I believe anyway, suggests that Russia historically has shown a concern with not allowing uh, China to connect in this way. I mean, one of the arguments back in the day for why the Russians went into uh, Afghanistan when they did, you know, long before the U.S. went in um, in the 80s and I believe earlier, um, one of the arguments for why they did that was to eventually punch southward and get a warm water port. And I suppose that would be a part of it. But I am um, increasingly of the opinion that at the time when the Russians did it, they did it in order to block the Chinese. So again, for all these people who are like, oh, her, 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 the Chinese and the Russians are going to be the best buddies ever. And the Chinese Russian alliance will get together with the Taliban and they'll just take over everything. And it's all going to be fun and games. No. Beneath the surface, there is, uh, I, I think, um, there is... Uh, there is good reason to 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 um, to believe that beneath the surface uh, things are not as uh, smooth as they seem be between Russia uh, and China. Now, before we move to the modern picture here, uh, Prudentialist, did you have anything you wanted to add? Oh yeah, I, I would say that the reason why I, I'm so inclined to agree with you about why the they were interested in holding Afghanistan in the '80s is a direct consequence of the American, you know, causing of the Sino-Soviet split. Um, at that point, you're seeing uh, increased liberalization, you know, communism with Chinese characteristics. Their trading begins to increase with the United States at this time. We're seeing increased isolation and then obviously fear that it's near abroad will then be cut off from trade with the rest of the Middle East and access to warm water ports, not to mention vast oil and mineral resources. So this is a, a significant motivator as to its a, uh, invasion in the 1980s. Um, and so I am not surprised during this time of the Northern Alliance, despite the fact that I was uh, not very uh, as keenly aware of what the goings on were as that as I was a child, not to out Oliver's age, but I believe I'm 25 years his uh, junior. <laughs> Sigh. I know. I'm sorry, man. But uh, no, I would, I'm inclined to agree that, of course, the Russians are going to do what they can to prevent their nearest geopolitical rival. Because, again, anyone's geopolitics are going to be immediately determined by what's on their border. Um, more so than anything. The United States is sort of the exception to that rule. Um, so yeah, the Northern Alliance controlling this corridor is definite proof that they were not wanting the Chinese to cooperate with the Taliban as far back as the 2000s. Well, then let's jump over to the picture that is um, more to the, uh, the present day. Sorry, there we are. So this is 2021. This is, uh, as you know, just recently, August 13th. And I guess this shaded aspect is, is supposed to indicate to us the degree of control. Now, the details of this to me don't matter all that much, except that they show that, you know, there's sort of a central area here, you know, that, that you know, the, the United States forces are and a coalition or whatever forces are currently pulling out of. And that means that, you know, they, the Taliban will not have, uh, seize them and consolidate its control as thoroughly as it has in these other places. But there's just one interesting thing I want to point out here for, for our purposes. And that's, they indicate this province that used to be blocked, that used to be the keystone of resisting. They indicate this province as, uh, as being fully in Taliban control. Hmm. Hmm. 
How interesting. You know, let's go over here and take a look at what's called Afghanistan-China relations. Hmm. Afghanistan-China relations. Hmm. See that little bridge? See that little connection there? Isn't that interesting how that works? Okay, let's take a look at Afghanistan-China relations. Well, there's this thing. It's called the Badakhshan base. We look at military cooperation. The Chinese People's Liberation Army trained and supported the Afghan Mujahideen during the Soviet-Afghan War. So we can see China and Russia fighting in Afghanistan once upon a time. The training camps were moved from Pakistan into China itself. Anti-aircraft missiles, rocket launchers, and machine guns valued at hundreds of millions were given to the Mujahideen by the Chinese. Chinese military advisors and army troops were present uh, with the Mujahideen during training. Hmm. Okay, now let's jump ahead to uh, September 2018. Afghanistan's ambassador to China announced that China will train Afghan soldiers in China, joining plane crews already training in China. Now, here's what's interesting. Badakhshan base. China is reportedly building a base for the Afghan armed forces in Badakhshan with the goal of strengthening counterterrorism operations. Uh, General uh, Daulat or Devlat Waziri of the Ministry of Defense said China will cover all of the base's material and technical expenses. Hmm. China wants to ensure stability of the region to counter the East Turkestan Independence Movement, or ETIM. The ETIM has bases in Afghanistan, and China wants to prevent them from radicalizing Uyghurs in Xinjiang and to prevent them from carrying jihadist and terrorist attacks, uh, carrying them out uh, on the mainland. Um, I don't know who's writing this, but I believe um, what they're saying is within the homeland. Um so the point here is, and I could find some other articles about this. If, if anyone wants to do so, they can go back and, um, and take a look. Um, but as of recently, within the last couple of years, certainly, uh, probably within as, as many as the last five years, the, even while the United States was still fully there doing its thing, Chinese military has op been operating on uh, Afghan soil. Um, they've got some quiet uh, bases and they've got quiet military operation and look where it is. They're not going to allow, they think, they think they're not going to allow this little finger of land to, um, to fall under the control of uh, rebel type people. The problem with that little finger of land though, as we've uh, discussed, is how rough it is. It's this little finger right there. But let's look at it with the satellite view. But this time I can find the borders. That's right here. Now let's take a look at it in terms of satellite. That's what this territory looks like. Let's just get in here so everybody can get it through their heads. This is what's known as rough country. This is not the kind of area where it's, for example, easy to um, hunt down quote unquote terrorists. This is not the kind of area where it is uh, straightforward to, um, to build roads. This is not the kind of area where, uh, for example, you can easily have your military come in and flush out quote unquote bad guys. Um, I mean, as Tim has pointed out in the past, there are areas of Afghanistan that are at such high altitude that, uh, for example, um, what is going on here with this thing? I hate when these things blow out. That's all right. I'll just move to another one. I've got real problems with this operating system. Um, anyway, there, there are areas that are at such high altitude that if you try to send in troops with helicopters, there's not enough atmosphere to keep the helicopter in the air. So the, this is a very difficult place to dislodge quote unquote freedom fighters or terrorists or guerrilla forces or whatever it is. So China thinks it's going to be able to hold on to this region. But the, uh, the question is, um, hmm, are they? And let's remember also that the United States has now had, I mean, if you consider the covert support for um, the Mujahideen when the Soviet Union was there. We've had at least 40 years of Christians in action running back and forth over all this territory, being able to bury whatever the hell they want, wherever the hell they want to do it. So 
I suspect that we're going to be seeing quite a bit of uh, uh, interesting fuss breaking out in this area. Um, but uh, I, I, I should give you a spot to jump in here, Prudentialist. What are, what are your thoughts? So along with the Chinese military involvement in this area, I want to say around 2014 onward, China has had a seat at the table with local uh, tribesmen and leaders in the community in Afghanistan, along with the Afghan national government, anytime that there was a conversation in regards to the Taliban, to a point where the Taliban would use it as leverage against the United States, even as far back as towards the second term of the Obama administration, that they would not engage in talks or agreements about ceasefires or anything unless the Chinese were there, to which, of course, China would happily oblige because they have a significant interest in this area. Um, and that's been going on, I believe, again, since 2014. But the other thing about the uh, corridor that we've been looking at, despite the fact that it's rough country and the American involvement in there, is that certain non-aligned uh, you know, Islamic groups and terror groups in that area that are also anti-Taliban in nature, like the um, East Turkmenistan uh, Islamic movement, the ETIM, they were forced to be labeled as a terrorist organization by the United States, so China would also recognize them. And I think that there's a little bit of shenanigans happening behind the scenes for that purpose that we can get into later. Um, but in 2019, the United Nations Security Council gave a very conservative estimate that along that corridor, there is anywhere between eight to 10,000 non-Taliban aligned, you know, Islamic groups in that area, um, whether it's the ETIM, whether it's the um, Islamic State in the uh, Khorasan region. Um, there are various, at least five or six uh, identified independent organizations in that area that are not aligned with the Taliban that do have an anti-Chinese uh, sentiment. Um, so there's definitely a lot at play there that we can get into real in depth, because I do think that from here on out, there's going to be a lot of disruption of Chinese you know, infrastructure building because of said terror groups. And there's been some recent goings on in Pakistan that I think supports this theory. Yeah, that would be the business with um, with the the bus full of uh, Chinese getting um, screwed up, would it not? Yeah, Chinese engineers. And that happened, uh, as I recall, you pulled up the information on that, and that is in Kohistan, was it not? Yes. And that is right here on the map. Everybody can see here's Kohistan. Hopefully you can see it. And you see how it's relatively close to this walk on corridor. So another thing to remember is that not only has the U S been doing covert things up in these high mountains for 40 years, literally the Russians were doing things in Afghanistan for quite some time. I mean, it, some of these Afghan fighters were using Jezail muzzle loaders, you know, flintlocks um, that were, you know, 200 or more years old up until recently. So, you know, uh, the Soviet weapons caches buried in the 1980s, if they were sealed up well, um, can be broken out and used by groups up in these mountains. Um, not, I'm not saying specifically in Pakistan, but this whole area, again, if we look at it as a satellite, I mean, it's the same crazy block of mountains, you know, um, and, uh, and the Chinese have been doing things up in through this area for quite some time too, because it wasn't recently that they, the Chinese took East Turkestan, just as it wasn't recently that the Chinese moved into, uh, Tibet. You know, a lot of this happened in the, uh, the 1950s. So many great powers have been playing games up in these mountains and, uh, to the points that, um, that uh, Prudentialist was just making, um, you've got uh, these these groups that are doing stuff in the Wakhan Corridor who are not aligned with the Taliban um, and uh, are not aligned with the Chinese. You know who they are aligned with? Uh, the idea of Turkic identity, because they see themselves, they either directly are Uyghurs or um, they are sympathetic to the Uyghurs, and um, many of them may be volunteers from other Turkic-speaking countries. So in addition to the splits between Sunni and Shia that are sectarian, there are ethnic splits between cousins of the Turks, cousins uh, of the Persians, and a, you know this sort of thing. So this is likely to be a, uh, a quite uh, messy area. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add, um, 
in that respect. I mean, this is just this is one of the major hot spots. I would expect we're also going to see, you know, just generally border issues in any number of respects. And they could also get very interesting along the border with Pakistan. We'll have to see. Um, but this area, I think it's going to be difficult for China to control uh, the kind of issues that might emerge. The other thing that you have to understand is once we get up into these high mountains, it's it's crazy rough country and everything. But remember, here's Jammu and Kashmir. So India is right up in and around this area too. And I just, I simply cannot imagine that that is any accident either. You know, they moved in and they have uh, taken over territory in Kashmir. They're constantly clashing with the Pakistanis about it. And I believe um, that that is uh, likely in part because they want to um, keep a seat at the table in terms of uh, dealing with these things up at the roof of the world as well. Remember, there are a number of different areas along here, not just in Jammu and Kashmir, but all the way along here, um, along the line of actual control in terms of the border between India and China where they're having issues. So this is this whole little area here is going to increasingly, I think, be a um, uh, an area to keep an eye on. Prudentialist, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Absolutely. So a few things to keep in mind when it comes to India is that China has been trying to increase diplomatic ties with them, I suppose, to sort of keep them at bay from their own interests. There has been within the last 10 years an increase in diplomacy as well as agreements about joint military exercises for border control and border security, um, mainly with a focus of migration and uh, drug trade. Sorry, um, uh, cooperation between whom? China, uh, China and, and India. Okay. Yeah, mainly along the uh, Indian-Chinese border, especially within the Himalayas. Um, they do often engage uh, along their joint mountain border and some in clashes, but again, there are at least nominally and on paper these joint border security agreements to sort of lessen that fighting. The other thing to keep in mind is that China's new sort of modus operandi when it comes to its infrastructure investment in Pakistan is that it wants to use its presence as a way to um, continue to stir up tensions, especially along the uh, Kashmiri region between the uh, Indians and the Chinese. So their continued investment strikes, you know, India to be concerned. And at the same time, it allows them to sort of stir the pot between India and Pakistan. So they're more focused on each other and not so much on, you know, India and China issues. Um, along with that corridor, as, as we were discussing, there are reports from the United Nations Security Council about various weapons caches that have been left behind. You mentioned Soviet equipment that had been left behind. There are reports that, that is there. There are various organizations there. Some of them are, um, you know, Iranian or Iranic in their background. Others are, you know, Turkmen. But uh, this also includes portions of what's left of Al Qaeda. So there's plenty involved in play here, and not all of them get along. So you're going to have inter, you know, Islamic group fighting, fighting against the the Taliban as they sort of try to establish a national government, and I would suspect any sort of you know hit and run operations against the uh, Chinese if they decide to move in there. But that's all, all right. I have for this area. A recipe, an exciting recipe. We'll just have to keep our eye, uh, eyes on that pot as as it uh, boils. So let's let's take a look uh, if we can here at um. Roads. This was a great little document um, that you found. Um, I'm not sure what you might want to pull out of it. I did not have a chance to read all the way through it, but uh, it did. You know, I had mentioned that China has already connected via Pakistan with uh, with Iran, but that's by going around uh, Afghanistan. You uh, found this little paper here, which is quite recent. I mean, I don't know how much more recent it can be. August 18th, 2021 uh, briefing on Afghanistan, China Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, it, it reviews a number of the potential routes across Afghanistan that um, China could take. Um, I could just go through it and sort of peck at it, but um, since you found it, it w would you prefer to to um, you know guide us through it or? Sure, so this lovely nugget of an article, um, I believe from, I think either Pakistan or in is uh, Indian, um, sort of analyst group, they were discussing the various ways in which China could potentially work its way into building, you know, its sort of Belt and Road Initiative plans for Afghanistan. 
And a lot of these plans, I believe, go as far back in discussions with sort of the um, plan document that Xi Jinping took uh, and, you know, publicized when he took power back in 2014. You can actually find a copy of it online with an English translation. It sort of outlines his plan for the country and what he wants to do in the region. Um, and Afghanistan is included. Um, but they do talk about the Wakhan Corridor and its history, about its mountain ranges, and some of the passes that it can make. Um, where it could go through, um, whether it is through the uh, Kalachigu Valley, um, which is not nearly as mountainous, and it, it is mainly through the uh, Chinese side. It can go through sort of a Pamiri region through the Wakhan Corridor, or the uh, Wakjir Pass, which is increasingly mountainous. It has an altitude of about 16,000 feet, so it would be very difficult terrain. It wouldn't be an area for you to go through with uh, aerial, you know, sort of... Um, transportation, and it would be difficult to build roads. And there is currently no road there at all. It's only like a cut dirt track. Um, and that right now it's only accessible to military personnel. So they think that it would be a very good way to sort of jumpstart a pass because, you know, you already have the military there. There's already um, existing military infrastructure to begin construction. But along with the Wakhan Corridor, there is discussion about also taking advantage of existing infrastructure that China has already invested and built in uh, inside Pakistan in order to sort of just cross into the country, especially with its road and uh, rail lines that are already being built. So there's a lot there. And one of them was specifically, let's see if we can find it here. Yeah, the Pakistan connectivity route. So one way that they were talking about doing it, um, this I believe is one where they come down from the north and they actually go around the Wakhan corridor. Everybody should be able to see this thing right here that says Afghanistan. That is that little finger that we call the Wakhan corridor. And apparently they have looked at a way of coming down from China straight down through the top of uh, Pakistan and then uh, heading west from there. And I believe we can see that um, sort of laid out here as well. Um, so they can run in this fashion from Peshawar to uh, Kabul. So there are ways, there are other routes that they can take. Um, but there are issues, you know, on the one hand, you've got the idea of all the, you know, the, the irregular forces and guerrilla fighters or terrorists or whatever the hell you want to call them in the Wakhan corridor. Um, but the, the fact remains that there's so much corruption and so many competing interests in Pakistan that there are doubtless ways where things could be destabilized um, in, in terms of this potential route uh, as well. Now, let's take a look over here. This is another one that uh, Prudential has found. This is um, part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Um, and these are some ways that they're connecting things at present. You know, you can see existing, which are the solid lines, and you can see planned uh, routes. And you can see how, as I said, they do have one sort of uh, primary railway running across Pakistan um, into Iran. But you can see how these things are not all fully connected, right? There's still issues here. And you can see how they have been building in anticipation in many respects of connecting with Afghanistan. So there's a, it's, it's just as uh, the Prudentialist was saying, there's just been, they've been planning this forever. So, you know, anybody who, Anybody who's listening who might still be clinging to the adulpated notion that the United States was in Afghanistan in order to keep America safe um, should probably flush that foolishness uh, directly around the toilet because this is a geopolitical, geostrategic. Um, these are moves on the board uh, in that respect. Um, and they are moves that are based on previous moves and counter moves that go back many decades, you know, prior to the 1980s. So again, this, this, all this nonsense about, you know, well, we've got to go take care and keep Afghanistan safe. So people come, don't come knock down buildings in the United States is just complete and utter, uh, horse shit. So let me see here. Um, I'm going to look through some of these other areas here, uh, Prudentialist, but did, did you have anything you wanted to add on this oh, subject? Well, I mean, between the existing railways and highways, the Chinese are definitely anticipating ready to move into Afghanistan. 
like I had mentioned earlier, there's been conversations about it, you know, published and documented since 2014 about an interest in going through Afghanistan for it. Um, and as you had said, yes, a lot of this is focused on keeping Chinese geopolitical and geoeconomic interests out of there. Um, I mean, and of course, people will ask, well, if it's, you know, countering China is so important to a geopolitical rival, like, why are they pulling out? I mean, you've got no political willpower to do so anymore. And despite that, the, I mean, between the lack of political capital, the, you know, focus continuing inwardly, I mean, any sign of an empire in decline is when you start no longer focusing on the outward and you bring a direct focus on the cultural and inward, um, whether that's domestic terrorism, my who wait supremacy, there's a lot to go on in there. Um, but I mean, the other big thing, right, for the last 20 years, especially with American involvement in Afghanistan, is that it kind of focused the Chinese to keep things flowing to the West and more importantly to the United States to keep our cheap goods. So there's a lot going on there. And I think as uh, Semyagog is looking for his tabs for what we're going to go over next, the most important thing to recognize is that China wants to get access to ways to bypass sort of the American, um, you know, geographic boundary of containment it's set up, whether that's through Australia, uh, South Korea, Japan, and of course the U.S. 7th Fleet in the region. Um, they're now looking in a way to sort of bypass that altogether. And what a better way to do that than to connect Afghanistan through Iran. So you're exporting and maybe getting oil out of, you know, into the sea through the Gulf of Oman, and you're no longer concerned about the Saudi American naval presence that happens within the Strait of Hormuz. So there is definitely a lot of ways to bypass the American presence because um, as many would note that, yeah, we've had enjoying our cheap goods and our manufacturing of the Chinese, but I, I guess there's now been this sudden wake up call that, you know, your actions have consequences. We talk about the Belt and Road Initiative and just recently, I think the G7 a few months ago talked about having their own sort of Belt and Road Initiative, the Build Back Better Coalition or something along those lines. It sounds awfully terrible. Um, so there's a lot to tell you that, you know, a lot of Western hubris is also at play here. This wasn't for security. This was for geoeconomic and strategic reasons. And we're now finally seeing the consequences of Western action. Yes. And in some cases, uh, inaction. Um, there's, well, for, uh, if it suits you, uh, Prudentialist, I'm going to cover this one last thing that I found oh, in this, this one paper. And then I was thinking we could just sort of spend our remaining time. We'll have roughly an, a half hour when I wrap with that. We can see if there are any uh, questions that really stand out for us so we can get a little bit of uh, audience engagement. Um, and we can also, uh, you know, basically share our thoughts on what the hell we see uh, as being the possible uh, scenarios, you know, branching off from our current moment in time. So the last piece I just want to put on here, which sort of um, reinforces some of the observations we were making earlier, you know, one of the big things is, you know, they're already connected through Pakistan. You know, if they need to get to Iran so bad, why don't they just do it through Pakistan? Well, because Pakistan is more directly within the range of India being able to do something about it. And as I said before, it's also more within the range of allies of the United States, as well as, you know, uh, uh, U.S. naval power being able to do something about it. And by that, I mean, you know, potentially interdict um, energy and, you know, economic um, transit uh, corridors. But let's jump over here. This is a paper I found that is... Um, entitled Integrating Afghanistan into the Belt and Road Initiative by one uh, Mariam Safi and Bismillah Ali Zada. Um, and this is produced by Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, and when does this date from? This is from back in 2018. But it is worth taking a look at just for its assessment of the security picture. Let me just... Oh, here's a general picture of the, uh, the Belt and Road so you can see what is uh, planned for that, right? Because you've got the maritime aspects as well as the over overland aspects. And these were plans that were put in place. You know, this is this is stuff from 2018 uh, or earlier because many of these graphics might predate the, uh, and likely do predate the publication. This is some more, um, you know, ideas of how this is going to work in terms of getting through um, this Central Asia zone into uh, 
the Middle East and uh, beyond to Europe because the Chinese, you know, are picking up ports in Europe and the rest. Let me just get back to where we were on this section with the uh, security issues. There we are. So let me just uh, spit this out really quickly and then we'll move to our sort of closing section. Afghanistan and the wider region have been a battlefield for global rivalries ever since the 19th century, if not earlier. Colonial empires and ideological blocs engaged in bloody wars in this territory, uh, infamously known as the Great Games. Afghanistan and the region remain a place in which geopolitical interests of an array of global and regional actors converge and conflict. Major actors like the Russian Federation, the United States, China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, India, Turkey, and the European Union are involved in the geopolitical dynamics in South Asia and Central Asia. These rivalries will have significant impact on the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, particularly on the um, China, Pakistan economic cooperation and the Silk Road economic belt. South Asia is divided between the United States, India axis, I suppose, and the China, Pakistan blocks. CPEC, the China, Pakistan economic cooperation or whatever the hell it's called, has contributed to these political and security block formations. In particular, the Indian government has expressed concern over the plan for the China, Pakistan economic cooperation to or economic corridor or whatever the hell it's called um, to pass through the disputed Kashmir territory. India sees the initiative not as an opportunity, but as a threat or a form of competition and is concerned over Pakistan's alliance with China. It sees that Sino-Pakistani alliance as dominating India in its northern and western regions, as well as the Arabian Sea, according to Riasi and Zhu. The CPEC has the potential to exacerbate three fault lines in South Asian security. The first is between China and India. The second puts China and Pakistan on one side and India on the other. The third is between China and India and its partners. That is India's partners, mainly the United States and Japan, but to a lesser degree, Vietnam. But did you want to uh, jump in there, Prudentialist? Or was that just a background sound? Uh, that was a background sound. Okay, no worries. So uh, basically, I just wanted to bring this up because it emphasizes again, even as far back as 2018, um, I guess it's not all that far back, that there are a number of challenges um, and that this is of serious concern to India. And particularly, it concerns India in terms of Pakistan coming increasingly under uh, the sway of China because it's direct competition. So this isn't just, you know, uh, craziness that, uh, the prudentialist and I are, uh, talking about. It's, um, it's something that's widely recognized by serious analysts and it's going to be, um, an important part of, you know, these concerns are going to be an important part of the calculations made by people who attempt to do something, uh, with this situation. But I guess now we can turn to uh, the sort of idea of what's going to happen here in this uh, this region, Afghanistan, and um, what we can expect to see uh, happen in future, what, what different ways it can go. Um, for my part, I'm sort of, how do I put this? I had at first thought that when we saw Biden speak about this, I was very interested to see it for one main reason, which was to find out if he started howling and um, getting up on his hind legs and um, talking about how, you know, an outraged America must return to do something about this. And I was very interested to see that he said nothing of the sort. And the idea was that it's a, uh, it's time for us to leave. Um, that indicates uh, that a choice was made. Now, I know that um, that uh, from the prudentialist point of view, we've got you know an inward turning empire. I, I, I think that there are issues, certainly like the general picture of the idea that the United States is currently um, is in decline, if not immediately in terms of its footprint of uh, projection of power. Um, that seems to be on the horizon and there's no question that we're just rotten to the core uh, inside uh, our country and its institutions. But as regards Afghanistan here, um, I think that we were not faced with the reality that we could no longer stay. 
Um, we continue to pay for it. We've continued to hemorrhage taxpayer money into the colossal pit of its corruption. And people have gotten just enormously fat um, with that corruption um, uh, on taxpayer dollars and, you know, blood and treasure, uh, literally people coming home from fighting with no legs if they come home at all, you know, this kind of um, evil shit. Um, but, but there, in my view, there's no reason why we had to leave. I believe that we chose to leave. And I think the reason for that is very likely that there is development that we want to happen there. Um, and we hit a ceiling with what we could do. And now the Chinese um, can come in and simultaneously a number of things can happen. This is sort of my guess, my, my main guess, um, my, my, my best guess. And it's very much what uh, Tim mentioned a long time ago. I mean, for longtime viewers of this channel, um, I will remind everyone that Tim explicitly said that we would pull out of Afghanistan and it would create a sucking vacuum that not only would the Chinese want to fill, but that the Chinese would have to fill and that it would become a graveyard of a third empire. You know, so very, uh, very soon now that's in Tim terms. So it could be another 10, 15, 20 years. But um, his view is that fairly soon, you know, um, John Q. Public and um, Ivan Ruski are going to be sitting on the sidelines sharing beer and vodka, laughing their asses off at what happens to the Chinese there. But the, um, the general view is that the Chinese will be forced to fill the vacuum and will want to do it as well. And in many areas of the country, they will dump huge amounts of money into building out infrastructure, and they will be able to do so in cooperation with the Afghan um, public to an extent that the U.S. either couldn't ever do or no longer can do. Many people will remember that when the United States first went into Afghanistan, they were considered to be buddies because they had helped the Mujahideen and they, you know, began to put together infrastructure projects and things were going fairly well. Um, and then it bogged down and things didn't work out so well. So perhaps the time has come for China to dump that money in to build out the infrastructure yet further. But critically, the nation can still be treated as a frozen conflict because Christians in action and others will be able to dump huge amounts of money but less than would be required by staying there as the dominant power. Um, covert operators would be able to dump money into keeping the resistance alive and that sort of thing. And we have indeed seen some signs of that. Let me find where these were. I posted some of these. Where is it now? Yeah, one of them. You know, this is something that... Uh, that uh, Prudentialist and I have been watching closely. You know, we're starting to see these uh, opinion pieces and the rest about the return of the uh, the Northern Alliance or the National Resistance Front. And now this is just one of the tweets about it, but we're you know immediately seeing talk of how a, a resistance will begin to form against the Taliban and they need help. So the the basic idea is that the U.S. moves out and China moves in, and now China can foot the bill for trying to drag this country up out of the Stone Age and connect north with south, east with west. Um, and it can be at China's expense. It will be a threat to China. Um, simultaneously, in our pulling out, we've now got plausible deniability. I mean, we basically said we're pulling out and look what happened. The whole country just, um, there's all kinds of fuss in the international media about it. Um, I think it's likely that we're going to see a whole lot more fuss and it will be, um, it'll be blamed on the Taliban, blamed on the Chinese, blamed on the Afghanis, won't be blamed on the Americans anymore, which basically means that now Christians in action and similar organizations, and remember, we also have to consider the possibility of the Israelis and the Indians and the um, Russians as well, all kinds of intelligence services can create all kinds of fun and trouble in Afghanistan for China. And because the uh, Americans are not the ones there who are, you know, quote unquote, responsible for all of it, the sky's the limit in terms of how much mayhem can be developed. Um, so that's sort of the general picture. I'm probably leaving out some points. Um, well, one of them is the Israel. I mentioned this yesterday with... Um, a stream, but Israel is going to be concerned about Iran connecting to China because they're going to be able to get goods out and sell them. They're going to be able to get goods in 
including Chinese military technology, much more easily than, you know, on board ships that the U.S. Navy, for example, can interdict. Um, Afghanistan has long been a part of a kind of uh, Western, um, excuse me, Eastern, on the Eastern side of Iran, a kind of blockade. Um, so Israel is going to take a personal interest in things that are going on in Afghanistan. Um, in terms of, you know, stopping arms from moving through or, you know, splintering up alliances that look like they're going to uh, uh, support Iran. And so we've got India that's interested in making sure things don't work out for China. We've got Russia that will probably not say it um, at the table, but underneath the table will probably be doing things to make sure that things don't work out perfectly for China, unless Russia happens to make a whole lot of money out of it. Um, the United States is going to be presumably against um, things working out too nicely for China. I mean, if the current regime ever changes right now, they seem to be in their pocket. But the point is that uh, a number of things could happen there. And um, my best guess is it's going to um, unfold, as I just mentioned it, which indeed uh, Tim uh, predicted quite some time back. The only other possibility I can see is that um, the U.S. is so firmly in uh China's pocket that um, Christians in action won't get up to their usual shenanigans. I just, I, but I, but I don't see it as likely. I don't see it likely that suddenly everything's going to get quiet in Afghanistan and everything's going to work out. Because even if you leave the United States out, you've still got Israel concerned about it, Russia concerned about it, and India uh, concerned about it. In addition to just the fractious, crazy ass goat fuckers fighting each other. So that's my general picture. I turn the floor over to you, Prudentialist. Uh, I'm inclined in to give this forecast. And I talked about it in the two streams on Afghanistan. I did a couple of weeks ago on my show is, is that if the United States and at least those in charge are not firmly in the pocket or have China's hands up that far up its ass, that they will take advantage of said sucking sound by, you know, providing funds to front groups or terrorist organizations, especially those along the Wakhan border, in sort of akin to take a Syrian civil war approach to it by having plausible deniability or providing funds and arms to rebel groups in the area. And I mean, already we're seeing those opinion pieces about that. Uh, Northern Front, the Northern Alliance supposedly coming back, Mujahideen 2.0, I think that there will be an argument to be made that the United States will fund these groups to disrupt the Chinese infrastructure projects in these areas. Now, you've mentioned Israel, and I think it's very important to note that if by chance you could scoot the map over a little bit to the uh, west, um, their semi-agogue, is that Israel, believe it or not, if you scroll up just a little bit so we can show Azerbaijan, um, Israel has Air Force basing rights inside Azerbaijan, and this has been used in the Syrian conflict. Now, when that is something important to concern, because Iran borders Turkey and Azerbaijan, um, which Azerbaijan was listed as an area of a map for um, the Belt and Road Initiative, even though the information is a few years old, it's still an important point um, for Chinese interests. So I would suspect that we will see an Israeli military involvement if China is successful in getting towards, um, you know, more Iranian investment in infrastructure and trade. Uh, I'm reminded of what Israel did in 2007 to Syria to disrupt its nuclear uh, enrichment facilities where they flew through Turkish airspace in the dead of night to bomb Bashar al-Assad's nuclear enrichment facilities in Syria. I would suspect taking advantage of its Azerbaijani basing rights that they would do something similar to Iran with any sort of infrastructure project that comes next. I think that there's a lot at play here, and I think that you're going to see a tug of war for the interests of Turkey between China and Russia. Russia keen on its main, you know, trying to strengthen its relationship between Turkey as it has been, you know, very cold over the last several decades due to its NATO membership, only now recently beginning to change. And then, of course, China, you wanting to utilize Turkey for its own Belt and Road initiatives to have access to the Mediterranean. So there are a lot of parties at play here, and I would suspect that we'll see a diplomatic tug of war between China and Russia over, the, uh, over Turkey, as well as the EU and United States. Israel will definitely get involved militarily if we see um, Iran you know, get closer and closer towards that Belt and Road initiative to Turkey or Azerbaijan. And then, of course, Afghanistan, even though the Taliban have announced cooperation and welcome Chinese cooperation and infrastructure investment, 
I do think that the United States will work very closely um, to try and disrupt that. And I would not be surprised if Russia does the same, um, citing border security concerns with Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, because already now the Taliban control the Afghan-Tajik border, and they have called uh, invoking sort of the CTSO agreement for the Russian military to come in. So there is definitely a lot at play here. And that doesn't even begin to talk about what, you know, India might do, especially as they continue to build up their navy. They could easily patrol the Gulf of Oman the same way that we patrol the Strait of Hormuz. So I think that we're not going to see any semblance of calm in this region anytime soon, even as the United States on official paper and on the official press record, um, you know, we've pulled out. But I think that all that we're doing now is giving us a front for the plausible deniability necessary to disrupt Chinese projects in the area. So that, that's my forecast. Yeah, I tend to agree. The only thing that I would add is that uh, is that little bit that I mentioned earlier on about the possibility for destabilizing surrounding countries. So very likely in addition to things getting messy in Afghanistan, we've already seen that it's entirely possible, if not probable, that um, trouble could shoot up the uh, Wakhan corridor into China because, I mean, you've got this whole business with um, East Turkestan and the Uyghurs and uh, that could get um, much more messy. Um, you know, I, when I was talking to Tim, he just kept hammering in this last call. I spoke with him briefly today and he was just like, everybody needs to understand that, uh, that China is, you know, is, is fixing to tumble down. Um, that it's just, it's, it's like a, 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 a giant that's falling apart. Um, now I'm, I, I don't know, you know, uh, we've been wrong before he's been wrong before, um, certainly within the time frame and time horizons, you know, that we've talked about. So, you know, could be wrong, but there is every reason to believe that there are all kinds of problems for China that could come out of this if instability, um, and, you know, border craziness extended, up into um, Xinjiang and things started to happen with the Uyghurs, uh, Uyghurs being riled up. And again, that whole business of being outside of Afghanistan and therefore being in a position where there's plausible deniability. You know, when the United States still occupied Afghanistan, um, it would be very easy to say the United States is doing this to us. Look what's happening. They're destabilizing China itself by, you know, supporting people within Afghanistan and Afghanistan is occupied by the United States. Therefore, the United States is attacking us. But if we pull out of Afghanistan and we make a big fuss of letting the entire world know that we really pulled out and that we're powerless and that we're inept and that everything is sloppy and we can't do anything right, then you've got a situation where it becomes much more easy to um, plausibly deny um, a program of systematic and methodical destabilization of things like Chinese East Turkestan, of potentially um, things like the Northwest Tribal Territories of Pakistan, of things like Iran itself, um, or even by pushing refugee flows in a certain way over a certain period of time, destabilizing Iran in that fashion, and uh, desta desta further destabilizing um, countries uh, like Turkey. And once you start playing games with destabilizing Iran, then you're dealing with the destabilization of their clients like uh, Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. So as you said, Prudentialist, there are any number of uh, of moving pieces here, and it's going to be very interesting to look at. This has been a very much a long and winding discussion. I appreciate everybody hanging with us. We've got uh, we've got I don't know about ten minutes left. So um, I'll tell you what. Um, since I've been talking so much, uh, Prudentialist, maybe take a look back through the questions, and or you, you've probably been tracking them to some extent thus far. Um, and if anybody has like one or two last minute questions you want to throw in here, because we just have a few minutes left, um, we'll do our best to answer them. But I'll turn it over to you, uh, Prudentialist. Did you see anything that people were asking about that you thought uh, thought was a good question? There were a couple. I'm going to pull them up real quickly here so I can I can find them for us here. Um uh, Baby Face Nielsen asked for you, Semyagog, do you agree with Zihan uh, that he gives a correct description of China's condition? I think he's referring to Peter Zihan. 
Yeah, I'm not familiar with uh, with whatever that is. Um, are you? I, he gives a lot of commentary and analysis on China. I've only read one of his books, which was more focused on American politics than this United States. Um, but I, I know that he sort of gives an optimistic viewpoint uh, on sort of the American Chinese rivalry. I can't give enough to, to answer Babyface's question. So um, more books and uh, commentary to add to my ever growing reading list. Yeah, the reading list that always, you know, that's always, you know, uh, three steps forward, one step back. Yeah, oh, it's, it's very true. <laughs> the, yes, the the beetle, beetling pile of books that always threatens to topple. All right, well, let's uh, let's take a look here and see if we have any other. Uh, let's see here. Steve is saying that Zihan or Zihan, I guess it's Zihan, predicts the collapse of the world order due to U.S. retrenchment um, and predicts that China will fall apart. Well, I, I certainly tend to agree with the vast majority of uh, predictions that Tim has made. Again, I'm not claiming that uh, he has not been wrong and that I have not been wrong and that we have not been wrong. But um, I do. I think that China's in trouble um, and that it's uh, far less stable than it uh, puts out that front of being. Um, all right, let's look back through here. You see anything else just scrolling through Prudentialist? Uh, there was a question about um, the impact that climate change might have that I oh. thought would be interesting simply because, you know, there are rising temperatures. I mean, Qatar, for example, you know, you're, you're hitting 125 degrees Fahrenheit on a pretty regular basis. I don't know if the heat may be, I think it would, if anything, rising temperatures would be an impediment upon, you know, construction projects, but I don't think that that would necessarily stop it. And the only thing I would add, though, is that I do agree with you, Semi Agog, that China is not as stable as it was. Um, President Xi Jinping did visit to the area where, you know, in Tibet not too long ago, just to make an appearance because he's concerned about the growing influence the Dalai Lama has. And uh, there is a demographic bubble that is uh, soon to pop. Yeah, and a whole bunch of men who want wives and can't get them. And only a certain number of them are going to be willing to go to places like Latin America and South Africa and pick up brides there because the, uh, the Chinese are not exactly, uh, an open society in that respect. Not to mention you have a population equal, if not greater now than the United States of people over 65 and not working. Yeah. I think that's all going to be very, very exciting indeed. Isn't it? Agreed. Oh, I love this. <laughs> Charlemagne just sits and snipes in the background with good remarks. You'd be glad to have physical books after Google and Amazon erase and edit all your digital books. Yes, that is true. And it's, I have it, it's coming, folks. And I've got just boxes and boxes. I just hate my books, but once I finally settle down permanently, I'll perhaps uh perhaps like them again. Okay. Well, we are we are coming up on uh the close. I'll keep an eye out if there are any like quick questions that can be answered, but uh, I would like to um, turn around actually and take this opportunity to uh, encourage everyone to go and check out uh, Prudentialist's channel. Um, you can follow him not only on his channel over on YouTube, uh, but also on Twitter. But uh, I'll let you uh, speak for yourself, Prudentialist, but make sure, sure to cover again for people who weren't here at the outset, you know, what your channel is about, what you do, that sort of thing, and let them know how to find you. Sure. So for those who kind of joined late, um, I cover a variety of, you know, concepts and cultural ideas. I try my best to avoid rank punditry. I'll do that sometimes on Sunday when I cover geopolitical events or if AA invites me on unpopular opinions. But I try and make stuff that, you know, uh, can last the test of time, whether that's conversations about localism um, or, you know, sometimes I'll talk about things that are on my mind. I, I go fishing quite often. I record footage for that similar to what Morgoth does. But every Sunday I stream um, and I have a conversation exactly with what, what Semiagog and I were doing. And I cover geopolitical events or theory. So if you're interested in knowing more about, say, some of the theory behind international relations, I give what is known as a neo-realist perspective. Um, I try to do my best there. And as well as, you know, talking about what's going on in the news, I have a, a three-week rule. So I hold off on anything that's immediately happening so I can give you historical and political context to it and base it on geopolitical theory. And that's what I do every Sunday. And it's a, it's a great show. I try my best to give PowerPoints and maps, just like Semi Agog did here. And I always end it on a strong note with a, a frog of the week. So I, I cover uh, a new frog, something for you all to just enjoy and give you a little smile after we cover a rather sobering or morose topic. 
And uh, I will be soon also write um, articles and pieces on Substack. So I'll be debuting that on September 11th, talking about, you know, America, the world, the last 20 years, and what me as someone who grew up during the George W. Bush years with a military parent, what that's been like. So there's definitely a lot to talk about. And that's what I do. Well, nice. Yeah, I just I should have put that uh, a link to your channel in the description. I just posted it in the chat. And as soon as we're done talking, I will roll on over and uh, and plug it in in the uh, the description as well so that everybody can find you. Well, we have a couple minutes left then. Let me take a look and see what it is I have coming on my calendar so I can just share it. It looks like well, that one has been canceled for the moment. So yeah, the uh, the next one I have coming up at present is one for uh, August twenty second. Uh, I will be continuing the light and uh, light in darkness series with uh, Anteos. He's a German historian. He's been on for a few episodes thus far. I think we've had three thus far. Um, and in that series, we um, basically track the overlap between secret societies and secret services starting with the florentine renaissance the house of medici you know florentine bankers and um people like marsilio ficino and the rest and we move up from there to the uh, rosicrucians the german states conflict between the habsburgs and the uh, protestants i believe the next one that we have coming up is going to sort of move uh, from the Rosicrucians to the Illuminati. So it's still probably going to be a part of that um, 30 years war and then post 30 years war period. And then from uh, from there, I believe we're going to move on to, uh, to the Freemasons and the French Revolution. And with any luck, we'll move on uh, beyond from there. So there is uh, there is that coming up on the 22nd. Otherwise, the only thing that I see at present I'll come up with something to do on uh, Wednesday next week. I have a few various ideas, but um, I have one for the 28th. I'll be speaking with uh, Tim Murdoch, um, Horace, uh, Horace the Avenger, White Rabbit Radio. But we'll see when uh, other things come up in the future. Um, yeah, Prudentialist, thanks very, very much for coming on. I appreciate your time. It's been uh, a great pleasure. Hope to do it again. Um, I think we... we uh, work pretty well together in terms of uh, geopolitics strategy and uh, analysis. So hopefully we can do it again. I want to, uh, again, also ask everyone, go check out his channel and uh, consider subscribing. So before we uh, disappear for the evening, Prudentialist, I'll give you the uh, the last word. Oh, I was going to say that you are more than welcome to come on any Sunday. And if you want to pick a topic or something that is of interest to you for geopolitical analysis, I'm all for it. So consider that invitation extended. And uh, to your chat and audience, you all have been wonderful to the new faces and names that I've seen here. It was uh, very much a wonderful time. So thank you so much. Excellent. Well, then, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate uh, so many of you coming in and so many of you sticking with us. We will doubtless be back again. Prudentialist will return, I feel sure. Um, and uh, certainly I will. So, oh, and go check out AA Stream. Uh, on Afghanistan as well, because there are a lot of um, insights and views from him, from uh, John D. Maven was on, and uh, who else am I forgetting? Who else was on there yesterday? I'm going to be ashamed of myself. Come on, Prudentialist, help me. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, <laughs> you you will remember. There's one person I, for, I'm, I feel sure that I'm forgetting. But anyway, go check out uh, AA's latest stream. And um, yeah. And we'll catch you next time. And and until then, um, I am Semiagog. And uh, how do I say this? I am out. <laughs>